today's workshop, I have been invited to talk specifically about description and what description allows us to do. These are the points I want to run through. I want to think about some strategies of description. I know that you all have already picked an image and I'm going to suggest that think about the image as a prompt to writing and what that means, I'll uh, elaborate on that. Now, we all started with an image, um, right? And we look at some of those images as well. So then we want to think about the difference between images, imagery, and metaphor, and why paying attention to that can actually help us write some uh, description. So we'll uh, think about that. Then we'll ask some bigger questions. Why describe? Why describe nature? When we describe nature, what is it really about? Uh, we want to think about some of these things. Now, I know this is a class in environmental communication and an important point is going to be who is, who is writing and in what genre. And this section of the course really deals with, um, you know, literary writing to a certain extent, but also the kind of writing that is, say, not uh, scientific communication about environment, about the environment. Right, So there are certain leeways of genre possible when we are writing like this, but in a different unit of the course, you will find that maybe those things are not as um, easily of, uh, used or maybe as effective if used. Uh, and, and I want you to alert, I want to alert you to that, especially because we'll be talking about uh, metaphor today. Though science writing uses analogy, I think science writing is very, very careful about metaphor as it should be. Right. So again, alerting you to that, that's something we'll talk about. And one last thing we'll think about is about the, the you know, I call this uh, workshop, the strangeness of familiars, right? So, you know, we like things to become familiar, uh, but is it any use to dwell on strangeness? And that's something that I will also think about together as we move on uh, uh, towards the end of the workshop. So these are the four things. Make sure I do all of these things and don't let you go without that. Okay, so, so the project today is to describe nature. And there are three images here that Joya shared with me that students in the class um, have um, taken as the prompt to writing, prompt to writing description. There were two more, one more butterfly and a plump, plump toad in the middle of a road. But the problem was that I could see it in the email, but when I downloaded it, it was in a format I could not copy and view. I didn't have the right software for it. So th that's the reason why those two aren't here. But this is the spread we are getting, right? And I thought uh, it would be interesting to begin by thinking about what description is and what I have for you. And you know, these are things very easily available to us tools to use. One is a Wikipedia entry, and I actually don't mind if people use Wikipedia, at least to begin with. And the other is uh, an etymology of the word description. And I'll tell you why it is important to think about both the things. So description, and let's start with the uh, Wikipedia uh, definition of it. Uh, may I request uh, Dia, who's at home, to unmute and read out the Wikipedia description, a uh, Wikipedia definition of the word description. So from Wikipedia, mm -hmm. description is the pattern of narrative development that aims to make vivid a place, object, character, or group. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dia, for that. So the, uh, and I've, I've highlighted two portions. There's narrative development, that aims to make vivid. Now, depending on what you're describing, it could be a person, a place, an object, uh, a butterfly, a bougainvillea tree uh, in blossom, a page from a notebook where there is drawing and writing. Uh, it could be any of these things. Uh, it aims to make vivid, make it really possible to visualize. Like that's the idea. But it also has something else. It's a pattern of narrative development. And we'll think about what that is. So Joya told me that you all have already written descriptions with your uh, photographs. But after having written the description, it's like, why are we doing this? How, if I have to write another page, what am I supposed to write? Right? And I absolutely agree and understand 
that that might be a challenge when you are using a photograph as a prop. So how do we work ourselves out of that, right? So what we need is narrative and we'll think about how to do that. But notice also that I've um, got the etymology of the word description and I want us to pay attention to that. And while I won't read all of it, uh, all of it aloud, you will notice certain things. So it really comes from the, the there's, a, there's a French origin, there's a Latin description and what does it all boil down to, right? It boils down to, a representation, description, copy, noun of action from part from a past participle stem of uh, describere, write down, transcribe, copy, sketch, de the down, and scribere to write. Right. I, I want you to pay attention to that because this is essentially. Description, the first thing to understand about description is that it is representation. Representation is representation, that something exists and you are now presenting it in your own words, right? And it could, and it actually has not just words, write down, transcribe, sketch. Um, uh, so there's drawing. In, in fact, I love the picture of the entry from the notebook uh, because it does all of that. And then there is, and I love that swirl because there's also room to think about what is going on with it. It's really a process and thinking that I'm seeing in that notebook page. And I absolutely loved it. And the way the etymology of the work description works, you notice that that is happening here. When you are describing, these are the things that you're really meaning to do. And that you have to think about the work of description along with this idea that description typically develops a narrative arc. And the goal is to make something vivid as you use your words to describe them, right? Uh, making narrative development and making vivid, we will focus on uh, some of that uh, very soon. And here I have an excerpt from um, Annie Dillard's little essay, Living Like Weasels. So we are going to highlight this piece of text in three colors, right? So one is yellow. Uh, and what we will do is we'll highlight all information that we learn about the weasel quite directly about the behavior of the, not just the weasel, but the behavior of a weasel. We will highlight all direct information about it in yellow. Then in green, we will highlight phrases and sentences where the author is inserting information to help us understand the weasel's behavior. Now, these are two things, right? So one is information about the behavior. The other is making sense of comprehending the behavior of the weasel. And we'll think about what, where that comes in and what those uh, phrases are and sentences and highlight them in green. And then in blue, we will highlight what I'm calling uh, or what can be recognized in this passage as analogy. And uh, what is analogy? An analogy is basically a comparison that we make between two things in order to explain one thing, right? And in all of this, you know, even in the previous slide, we said making vivid. Uh, making vivid for whom? Why? The idea is that you are experiencing or seeing something and say your phone camera one day just refuses to work and you're at this really pretty place and it's a gorgeous sunset and you want to tell someone about it and you call up a friend and you say you can't believe how awesome it looks and you can't send a photo so you have to paint a picture in words to really convey so make vivid that moment that you found so amazing to a friend say on the phone so that that idea that the people you are describing this to are not there in that moment with you and you have to make it come alive for them so keeping that in mind again right so these are the three things we look at so analogy is trying to explain something with the help of something else and when we look at it it will get clearer i'll spend some time on that samir are you still here yes you are right may i request right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, may I request you to read the passage, please? Sure. A weasel is wild. Who knows what he thinks? He sleeps in his underground den, his tail draped over his nose. Sometimes he lives in his den for two days without leaving. Outside, he stalks rabbits, mice, muskrats, and birds, killing more bodies than he can eat warm and often dragging the carcasses home. Obedient to instinct, he bites his prey at the neck, either splitting the jugular vein at the throat or crunching the brain at the base of the skull, and he does not let go. 
one naturalist refused to kill a weasel who was socketed into his hand deeply as a rat's head the man could in no way pry the tiny weasel off and he had to walk half a mile to water the weasel dangling from his palm and soak him off like a stubborn label thank you so much so uh, i'll give you a second to pause over the text and then i'll start reading the sentences and we'll start highlighting and you can tell me what needs to go in yellow what needs to go in green and what needs to go in blue uh tia you have a hand up yes uh, professor i just had a doubt yes i wasn't clear on exactly uh, so where we have to highlight in green we'll do that we'll go through okay. this so green right. is basically any information uh, that the author is giving to help us understand the weasel's behavior and when we go through the sentences maybe we'll be able to see the distinct distinction more clearly so why don't we just start with that all right professor thank you right uh, so yellow is direct information about the behavior or the habitat or whatever about the weasel so when i say a weasel is wild which, which color does it go blue green or yellow Uh, would it be green? Um, uh, it it would be green. Yellow. Yellow. Uh, it would be. Okay, let's just put this in green for the moment, and we'll come back and decide whether, in comparison to other things, whether it needs to be green or yellow. Who knows what he thinks? <laughs> would that be green? that would absolutely be green right so we don't know what a weasel thinks and that has got nothing to do with the weasel itself or the weasel's behavior right it's clearly the author saying there's something i don't know and i can't get it to the weasel's head and i don't know who, who who knows what a weasel thinks what about the fact that the author keeps on uh saying that the weasel is a he and i've given you a little photo also i mean i went and looked up a weasel and i couldn't believe how cute they are but all right so he the fact i mean it could be male or female we don't know uh, but she calls it a he does a so about that that also seems like an insertion a kind of an extra information a kind of a and why does dillard do this it, she could have just said it for example but she doesn't do that and i think it's significant for what the essay ends up being i think it's significant that she decides and gives it a gender as well right and i would doubt very much that unless someone is an expert uh, sees a creature in the wild uh, you know especially the ones that you can't tell the sex apart so easily uh, would know whether it's a male or a female he sleeps in his underground den his tail draped over his nose yellow or green or blue i think the first part would be yellow yeah it sleeps in it so now we know where it sleeps it sleeps in a den and it's below the ground so that's yellow then the second part would be green how why do we say that it's green i well we can't be sure that every male drapes their tail over their head well if she's saying and she's describing it's possible that that's how they sleep right so let's say that we don't know about weasels and we want information uh the, the the draping of the tail uh, over his nose might be that might be the position in which uh, weasels uh, sleep and uh, so let's say that we put it in yellow sometimes he lives in his den for two days without leaving yellow yes absolutely right so not all creatures come out of the den all the time especially after they have uh, had a nice big meal uh, many creatures will you know sleep for many days in the den and then come out when they're hungry again outside he stalks rabbits mice muskrat birds muskrats birds killing more bodies than he can eat worm often dragging them the the carcass home how about this entire sentence also yellow yeah this is yellow again obedient to instinct he bites his prey let's do this part and it what does it describe it describes exactly the action that allows a weasel to catch its prey right bites his prey at the neck either splitting the jugular vein at the throat or crunching the brain at the base of the skull
Which color? Yellow. Yellow, right? Yellow. How about this part? Obedient to instinct and he does not let go. Right? So even though, I mean, there's a way in which these phrases help us, give us, I mean, she could have just left it at the information, right? That this is how a weasel bites into an And when you do your scientific communication part of your course, uh, you will have to see whether phrases of this kind are going to be admissible in that um, or not. And you'll have to check with the person who's uh, teaching you that workshop. And of course, the readings that you're doing that um, also, but be alert, be alert whether that genre of light, uh, writing would have these kind of green sentences. And we'll come back to why, what the function of these are uh, in this kind of writing. One naturalist refused to kill a weasel who was socketed into his hand deeply as a rattlesnake. How about this part? What is this? A blue. It's an analogy. It's a blue. It's an analogy. That must be it. Um, so deeply as a rattlesnake. So you get a, a, a blue because it's an analogy. The man could not, and this is an interesting story, and the man did not want to kill the weasel. So the weasel, is, so now we know how the weasel holds on and doesn't let go uh, from the previous sentence. So this man didn't want to kill the weasel. So walked to a water body half a mile, with the weasel dangling from his palm. Very, very important. And is the dangling from the palm, sh should it be uh, yellow or green right now? Or the man walking half a mile, should this be green or yellow? Just this part. I would think it's green. The weasel dangling from his part, is it additional information or literally that's what's going on? Literal information, or is it? Uh, she didn't have to like, say it like that, so that's why I feel like it would be. No, but this is literally. So this is a story. There's a man who uh, who has been bitten by a weasel, and the man could just kill the weasel, but decides not to kill it. So is walking half a mile to a water body, and in the meanwhile, what's the weasel doing? It's dangling from the palm. Is it a part of the literal description or is it uh, analogy or is it additional information? Is it literally happening? It's The question is as simple as that. Is it direct information about what is literally happening? Yeah, I would say. Yeah, right? It's literally, it's direct information about weasel behavior that if it's caught on to something, remember it's not going to let go. And this is what it means that for half a man, Mile, this person is walking with a weasel dangling from the arm. I can't even begin to imagine how painful it might have been, right? But then even this part, he had to walk half a mile to the water. Again, it's a literal description of an event, uh, of something happening. And this part, and so can the, why is he walking to the water? Well, then dip the water, uh, dip the hand with the weasel, uh, stuck to it and soak him off like a stubborn label. What is this? Uh, blue. Blue. Why is this blue? Because he's using um, the the analogy of a um, stubborn label that uh, whose uh, adhesiveness gets uh, reduced in water to yes. describe the weasel uh, there you finally go. leaving his Wonderful, hand. right? So if you've ever got a jar of jam or some bottle with a label on it, you got to soak it in the water and then the label comes off, right? The glue loosens and it comes off. And that's literally what this naturalist did. Instead of killing it, uh, took the walk half a mile, dipped the hand and then the weasel eventually let go, right? So what do we have here? We have um, a sentence like, who knows what he thinks, obedient to instinct, he does not let go. Sentences like, soak him off like a stubborn label. Um, and of course, uh, descriptions of what a weasel does. So if we just look at it, what do we uh, notice, right? First of all, what do you notice? So if you give me some observations, I'll uh, type it up. If it's in the chat box, Samir can read it out to me. Uh, if people want to respond from the class, they can say it aloud and I'll type it up. So uh, what, what are we learning from Dillard about different strategies of description in this? I see a hand up, Sarah. 
Um, I'm sorry, I actually have a doubt. If yes, please ask. Um, the part where she talks about the naturalist and she describes this entire journey of, you know, a right. weasel, is, would that part be in blue, uh, in green, that entire part? Because um, it's not an information that she needed to give, but she gave it just to make us understand how a weasel does not let go. Well, uh, what happens is that within this uh, passage, I have picked a portion which includes a description uh, of uh, it, 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 it includes an anecdote about a naturalist who experienced something that helps us understand about weasels, uh, about the weasel's behavior. So I wouldn't say that she didn't have to do it. If it's there, she had to do it. But what we are trying to do right now is try to understand the different strategies of description, right? So she puts in an anecdote. The way to think about would be to say that she puts in a descriptive anecdote that both has, and it's actually full of analogies. So it has direct information like, okay, it bites really hard. And if you don't, if you want to let it, make it let go, then you have to dip your hand in the water because that's when the weasel can't handle it and will leave it and swim away. Right. So that would be one way to reread it and say it's an anecdote, it's a descriptive anecdote that includes direct information as well as analogy. Does that help, Sarah? Yeah, makes sense. Right. Thank you. So quickly, uh, what, what are we learning from all of this? Any strategies you can name already? So the yellow portions are descriptive details, right? So when you are describing nature, uh, when you are describing anything, and when it comes to nature, we'll have more specific questions. But when you are describing anything, so you need some descriptive details uh, of the actual object, of the behavior of the actual creature, what it does, where it lives, what the habitat is. Uh, this is one way to think about it, that you need something about it and elsewhere. This is just the very, very beginning of the essay elsewhere. She talks about, you know, the, the it's white, furry sort of, uh, 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 it's white fur under the neck and all of that. She talks about, so there's a lot more going on even with description. But just from here, what do we learn? We learned that you need descriptive details that are informative about what's going on with the creature, right? Um, what else do you know, uh, do you see uh, she's doing? Yes, Joya. So am I allowed to say something? Should yes, I? of course. Absolutely, absolutely. Please. We talked a little bit about this in class too, but you know the choice of the singular, uh, you know, the weasel rather than say weasels live in. Yeah. So what is that's a great question. Why does uh, Billard do this? Why does she make it a he? Or uh, I could have used she, but she she doesn't say it. She says he. But the singularity, also the singular, and of course, yeah, giving it a, a gender. Mm -hmm. It's singular, yeah. it's gender. It's a kind of personification. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, why is it a personification? That portion, I will not be getting into the essay, but there is a portion where they lock eyes. <laughs> And it's like it's like a thing between lovers and a thing between enemies. It got into my head. I got into its head. Right? Remember that entire portion where it's like the meeting of two protagonists who are equals almost. Right? And it's it's a kind of a description of a conflict. And to me, that was the pivot to understand why she says a weasel is wild. Who knows what he thinks? And there is going to be a portion, she says, no, for a moment I got into its head and it, he got into my head, right? Uh, I, I thought that that was really crucial to understanding why she's writing this piece. We will come to that in a minute. Uh, but it's an important point that this allows personification. So she is personifying the weasel that she is describing. So that would be one way to think about that. And that was one of the points I was hoping would come up. Is there anything else? What is the, so now the slight confusion we are having about the green parts and the yellow parts, right? What are those green things and are, is it helping with the yellow things? And I'll give you a small hint. 
you know, in that very first slide we looked at, we said, okay, you need descriptive details, you know, representation and writing down and sketching and painting word picture, all of that. What was the other thing? We said it needs a narrative pattern that makes something vivid. Where is the narrative? What are the green things doing? Obedient to who knows what he thinks. A weasel is wild, obedient to instinct, and he does not let go. One of the one naturalist refused to kill a weasel who was socketed so deeply into the hand. This part, one natural. Why I get into an anecdote? So, and you know, here whoever asked me that question was right. I mean, why why did she pick this? She could have just not had this, right? It's not essential to understanding uh, a weasel's. Uh, uh, I mean, not everybody who will write about a weasel will have an anecdote about a naturalist, right? So what are the green sentences doing? So descriptive details in order to make sense need what? Some kind of interpretation or something that tells you why it's relevant to even talk about this. Good job. Good job. Absolutely. Some kind of an interpretation. And that interpretation is coming to us how? Is it coming like, so interpretation is analysis, analysis is meaning making. So what are these sentences in green doing? Who knows what he thinks? Obedient to its instinct. And he does not let, let go. So these are helping us understand uh, the weasel's behavior, but a, an interpretation and analysis that is coming to us in the narrative. And the anecdote is such a great example. The anecdote is literally telling a story, right? So she tells a story about a naturalist who had whatever, blah, blah. So, so excellent. So we've honed in, honed in on three very important points that you need sort of descriptive detail that makes vivid. And those vivid making descriptive details are framed in a kind of narrative. And here the narrative a weasel is wild, who knows what he thinks. And of course, the way the story is going to proceed in the essay, it will become very important. And, and we'll, we'll get to that part, why Dillard is going to say no. Uh, you know, wh why I say it is wild and what that, why that is significant will come to us later. So having looked at this um, and having spent more time on this uh, than I thought I would, uh, quickly, I want to also think about this. So the other thing that we noticed here, uh, sorry, and I missed writing that point here, is that there is analogy. We look for analogy as well. And analogy, and the analogy is the, 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 what we highlighted in blue, um, as a rattlesnake and soaking off like a label. And here she is using actually um, uh, similes. So we, I want to focus a little bit more on those two. So we've talked about the description and the framing narrative that uh, makes sense of the description. And the third one I wanted to focus on a bit. And here, uh, partly also because you're looking at writing that is literary, uh, you will find that um, uh, uh, you will find that there's two kinds of usages of figures here, right? So you found as a rattlesnake, uh, soaking it off like label. So what are these two things? And I think it's really important to pay attention again to how description utilizes imagery and metaphor, and they're not the same things. Uh, and this awareness and writing more of this will also help you write a little bit more about whatever you're describing, especially if you're using it as an image. And I'll just take you through this, right? So I made two columns and I've given you a snapshot of the difference of uh, imagery and metaphor from Wikipedia. No, this is not Wikipedia. This is languagehumanities.org. I Googled it, whatever the first thing came and it was very uh, useful. Even that is very helpful. So the difference between imagery and metaphor, how are we writing these things? This distinction is important. So what is imagery? Uh, according to our definition here, it says imagery refers to the description of a person, place, item using the five senses. Very, very important. So anything that an image that is descriptive utilizes the five senses in order to create that vividness, right? So an image is a vivid description of something and it involves one or more or all five of the, sentence, uh, of, of the senses. It evokes all of that and you utilize all of that to make to create an image, right? So that's your imagery. 
but the term metaphor refers to the comparison of two unlike elements by using uh, like or as of course we are, we are making a fine distinction here that there's a simile there's a metaphor and i've also added allegory um, and i'll quickly tell you what all of that is but the main thing to remember that an image is a moment is something that appeals something that one of your senses has recorded more than one possibly also but something that the senses record as an image and that image of course the image word is visual but that image may be olfactory may be auditory it may be something that you taste it may be something that you feel on your skin it could be a sensation so i've given you a bunch of images on the left side of the column so for example dew drops glistening on the champa blossoms and i know sri city and other places have lots of blossoming champa trees right uh, frangipani trees and if you look at the flowers early in the morning you will see dew drops on them right so dew drops glistening on the champa blossoms and if you haven't come back to campus or not been to campus and you remember campus and you're like oh i remember what i remember is dew drops glistening on champa blossoms and it's a very vivid image right so that's an image it's an image it's a visual vivid image an unexpected smell of jasmine and this is also campus if i remember right unless it's been built over there used to be a clump of jasmine bushes that assaulted me one day i didn't even realize they were there right so an unexpected smell of jasmine again smell unexpected you didn't walk into a place that you expected to smell it it's a it's something that's uh, um, all factory right it's an all factory image that's it and and that is it that's the beginning and end of it it's a description of an image right a splash after a frog jumps into a pond and that's actually both auditory as well as visual uh, so you see a frog jumping there's a splash and that's it it's an image that involves more than one sense and it's descriptive it's very vivid right singed wings of a moth drawn to a candle right uh, to the flame of a candle and you know moth comes burns its wings again a very vivid image uh, which uh, maybe you smell the burning maybe you uh, see uh, the moth coming there burning its wings so again image a moment is being vividly described this is description using imagery now what's the difference between imagery and metaphor so it's the same thing the yellow and the green sentences right um, so what happens when you cast it in the form of a simile and here i'm there's a fine distinction when you say you use as or like with simile with metaphor you don't and with allegory when you've extended the metaphor for a, a length of time over the piece and you know it, it really works through the piece and it's a very it's been developed through the whole piece it's called an allegory we'll come to that but the basic thing to remember is that a metaphor will make it it's a juxtaposition there's more than one thing one thing to help explain another thing that's the basic rule of analogy and these are all examples of analogy um uh, that what how do you make sense of it you utilize it in a circumstance the circumstance which helps you make meaning so i'll read read out the examples so dew drops glistening on the champa blossoms by itself imagery very vivid could be applied in any context could be a memory from anywhere but a specific thing here when it's made into a metaphor looks like this tears on his young cheek were like dew drops on a champa blossom right so tears somebody some some young child boy is crying and the tears on the cheek were like do you drops on the jumper blossom now what does that mean it's open to interpretation but you see how one thing is used to explain another so what whoever is looking at this clearly doesn't think this is a major tragedy um, there's an aesthetic quality to it there's it's open to interpretation what this means what this crying means because the metaphor is like you drops on a jumper blossom right next an unexpected smell of jasmines a surprise so pleasant it was an unexpected smell of jasmine so no use of as or like here becomes metaphor right a splash after a frog jumps into a pond it was in a big deal a frog splashing in the water really 
right? So then that tells you that whatever that event was, someone is really congratulating you and saying, oh, wonderful, you got that award or you did this. Mm-hmm. Then you local newspapers carried it and say, ah, it wasn't a big deal. Frogs splashing in the pond. One tiny frog jumps into a uh, pond. It makes a little splash if somebody's ever not a big deal, right? So suddenly what was just an image helps in meaning making and interpretation, as you all rightly pointed out. Singed wings of a moth drawn to a candle. And you can write a whole story here, actually, right? Of course, love hurts. She's like mo- she's like a moth to a candle and has singed her wings, right? Again, open to interpretation. And you can say, oh, why was she drawn to this person? Of course, if you're going to be drawn to this person, you're going to get hurt, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you see the difference, right? So one is a kind of description that describes an actual natural event or object or phenomenon. The other frames it in a, the minute you get into analogy, a simile metaphor, et cetera, you're beginning to describe it. And depending on what you're writing, you may be using both image imagery, but also simile metaphor, and you'll see why that becomes important. Now, before I move to uh, the next part of it, I'd like you to take a look at these two uh, images and I'll have some short exercises for you. It won't take very long. Take a look at this. I'll repeat them, but just take a few seconds to observe these two images. Having looked at it, now these images are a little smaller, they're the same thing. I have a very small writing exercise. I'll read out a question and write down and request you to write responses to it one sentence each, not more than that. Don't overthink it. Write down your responses either in your notebook or your Word document and then post it in the chat box or read it out aloud when I ask you to. Okay. So these are your two images. You can pick only one of these two or both. Depends on how you want to go about it. But you can just pick one of these images to write on, keeping the other in mind, right? Okay, so question number one. Write one sentence that gives a literal description of either one of the images. So just one sentence where you describe literally, give literal information that what we were doing with the yellow highlights of either one of the images. As I said, don't overthink it. Any one element of it that's just literal. Color, shape, creature. That's it. One sentence. Nothing more than that. Done? Okay. Write one sentence where the images prompt a metaphor. This might take a little time to think, but it prompts a metaphor. You remember how in the last uh, slide I... um, created metaphors of the the imagery by putting it in a context, by putting it in a story, using it to explain something else, really drawing a connection between two things, uh, which is really your work. So try this, write one sentence where the images prompt a metaphor. And the last one, write a sentence that personifies the butterfly. And we saw how Dillard did it. Dillard just gave it a gender. And by giving it a gender, she made it a person. So that eventually when they have that eye lock, it's like almost like they are equal competitors, uh, equal protagonists in conflict, right? So she creates a protagonist by giving the weasel a gender, calls the weasel a he. So that's her trick. Uh, Can you... Describe the butterfly in words that you usually describe humans in or or the chapel with the shells. Um, Something that humans would do. Okay, quickly, can we have some responses then? You can unmute and speak, type in the chat box or read out your responses. So the first one, a sentence that gives a literal description. The beige colored butterfly sat with folded wings on a yellowing plant stone. Very good. 
I think there's another one in the chat box. So uh, there's one in the chat box. Samir Bhai, are you there? Yeah. The funky, this is the Dia. The yeah. funky slippers with their neon straps are covered with the duller and deeper colors of shells, sand, and starfish. Thank you. Wonderful. Funky. Of course, the word funky already begins to interpret the chappal. So in the literal description, it's just literally what is there. So I would say the slippers with the neon straps, that's literal, are covered with the colors, the dull, deep colors of shells, sand, and starfish. So I would say the funky is an interpretative uh, analytic word. It tells you how to think about it. But without that, it's an excellent sentence in literal dis description. Very, very good. How about this one? Write one sentence where the images or image prompts a metaphor. What kind of metaphor? This is like what? This, this, is, this reminds you of what? That's a good way to do metaphors. This reminds you of what? Atan, we go ahead. Um, I wrote that the shells bury the shoes under themselves as if claiming the shoes as their own territory. Their own territory. As their own territory. How about my, as their own footwear? <laughs> right? Yeah. right? As their own footwear. So here it's like the shells are wearing the chappals, right? So they are they are doing that. Or uh, That's actually a very interesting imagery because we don't think of shells as wearing chappals at all, right? But here it seems like they've grown feet to wear the chappal. So that's very nice. Lovely. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, it's Sarah. The moth is a tired traveler resting on the strap of a plastic chappal. So the metaphor here is the moth as a tired, tired traveler. Beautiful. I love it. The moth as a tired traveler. Let's just sit on the chappal. Whatever is available, let's sit on that. So the moth as a tired traveler. Lovely. Very, very nice. So, so what's happening is that we are creating, using the image to create a kind of metaphor that helps us understand uh, or make sense of the image. Now, who is it in terms of, is it the moth or the person looking or the person writing? We'll come to that later. But now you see the difference. You see the difference between the yellow, uh, between the first sentence which said, uh, literally, the moth is, there's a, there's a beige moth on a yellow strap. Uh, that's literal, but a tired, the, the tired traveler, the moth is a tired traveler sitting now is a is a metaphor. Beautiful. Very well done. Last one, this, this should be a little easier. Write a sentence that personifies the butterfly. In the chat, we have Aishani. Uh, the moth, she landed gracefully with gentle feet on the vessel of others. Wonderful. The moth landed gracefully with gentle feet well, on the vessel of others, I'm not able to understand, needs a little explanation, but this idea that landing on something with gentle feet. So, yeah, so these are different ways of associating this with something else. And it makes that association, that juxtaposition, meaningful, right? So this is one order of sort of thinking about how to write about nature, where you're using a photograph as a prompt, and we will talk about that also. Uh, and moving on from that exercise, I want to take you to uh, Parimal Bhattacharya's uh, little bit of, and this is all the excerpt that I have used uh, from, no, there's one more example, but from the uh, chapter Bay of Bengal, from the book, Field Notes from a Waterborne Land. Uh, and what I've done is I've given you the first part, the very first paragraph under the subsection, Hermit Crab, and I've given you something right from the end of that chapter, couple of lines on the, uh, on the right. Uh, Samir, may I request you to read out uh, beginning the, from the beginning of the chapter? Right. Hermit Crab. At first, it seemed his shabby clothes and unkempt appearance had roused the beach dogs. But on closer inspection, the fact turned out to be different. He was stealing their food. Using a twig, he was digging into the sand, teasing the crabs out of their burrows. And in one swift motion of his fingers, breaking off their claws and stuffing the thrashing creatures, red as pomegranate flowers, into a polythene bag. We had seen the hunting ritual of the dogs. They did a lot of running and chasing about all over the beach, shoved their muzzles into crab holes, and dug heaps of sand with their forepaws. But after all the effort, their success rate was pitiful. In contrast, this man's technique was smart and graceful. In no time, the poly bag was full of the crustacean harvest. 
and that was why all the beach dogs had formed a gang and were snarling at him okay so we'll read the end of the chapter later uh, but as you look as you uh, read this um, i'll just say a few things one that again what we have here is an anecdote so there was an anecdote about a naturalist in dillard's uh, uh, description uh, in dillard's essay naturalist who was bitten by a weasel and wouldn't want to kill it and uh, and therefore took the trouble of bearing the pain to walk half a mile to make sure that the weasel actually uh, got away alive and that the naturalist also got away alive right um so here's another anecdote this one by bhattacharya and what this anecdote is describing I, again just read it as i'm talking uh what is this anecdote describing it's describing a scene on a beach right there's a man whose appearance is shabby and looks unkempt and who's uh, who's standing at the beach and there are beach dogs that are growling and snarling at him it seemed at first that that was the reason why that this person is dressed shabbily and that's why the dogs are uh, uh, snarling at but on closer inspection it turned out that the reason why the dogs were snarling at this unkempt shabby looking man on the beach is a, a different reason he was stealing their food how is he stealing their food uh there's a description again look at it um, uh there's there's then a literal description and you realize that literal description framed with narratives is how descriptions work right so what does this man do the man takes a twig goes to the crab holes if you've been to a beach you know that there are all these crab holes where you know there are crabs digs them out breaks its legs puts it in a polythene bag right now but why why is again that moment, that conflict that encounter between human and creature that encounter between human creature in dillard the encounter between human and creature the, the story of the naturalist here uh, so but then what's the problem the problem here seems to be that the dogs like to eat those crabs and they have their own technique of hunting the crabs they they put their muzzle in and they use their four paws to dig there's a description of all of that and they're not as good at it as this man is right this man's technique was smart and graceful so he would just take it take a twig pull it out put it in a polythene bag and before long he has a polythene bag full of these crustaceans and mind you these crabs are not hermit crabs the section is titled hermit crab but these crabs that are being found and uh, that portion you read in the next paragraph these are red sand crabs which even in fact the beach that i live by they are running around all the time and they don't look very substantial actually to eat it seems and i've seen people come in hunt uh, you know fish for clams and other things also available on the shore no one really bothers with those crabs because they're not very delicious to eat right but anyway the dogs don't mind them but this person has got a bag full of these crustaceans and the dogs are mad because the dogs eat those and here is this man that stolen coat and coat stolen from them and they had formed a gang and were snarling at him so that's what your paragraph is Samir, may I? So this is right at the very beginning. How about the end of the chapter, Samir? Can you read that for us? Yeah, end of the chapter. Here I found him. He was standing on raised ground, facing the wind, contemplating the ruins. His back was turned to me, and yet I recognized him. Did he live in one of these concrete shells, like a hermit crab? Thank you, Samir. so for those of you who haven't read this and you don't know uh, what this chapter is about if i asked you on the basis of just these two things the beginning and the end the quotations that i have given you if you had to guess what this was about what would you guess right so in the last quotation that sami read which is at the end of the chapter uh, just know it's a, it's a shorter one so take a minute um well, not a minute take 20 seconds to read this uh, out to yourselves my question is what is this chapter about just on the basis of these two examples you if you don't know the rest doesn't matter what is the chapter about uh, it's the chapter is section hermit crab is it about hermit crabs and i've given you a picture i i would say it's about the man that they talked about at the start yes that it's about the man 
Now, hermit crabs, if you don't already know about them, they have a very uh, special uh, thing going on about them, which is what? Hermit crabs are born with really uh, soft shells, right? And they outgrow them very quickly. And unlike other crabs, where the shell will grow hard and keep growing with the creature as it grows to its adult size, a hermit crab actually doesn't have a shell that's that, that, that just grows on its body. So hermit crab finds things to get inside that serves as a shell to protect it. And that may be shells of other creatures, other creatures who have abandoned or died and they'll get to crawl into those. Or sometimes, uh, you know, it may even be like an object cast like a plastic bottle or something like that. They found it and they can hide inside it. They will use that as a shell. So that's the special thing about the hermit crab because all other sea snails and crustacean creatures that live in the sea have their own homes, right? They don't have to go occupy the shell of another creature to find a home. And that's special about the hermit crab. And somebody already answered and said that these two paragraphs, even though it is titled hermit crab, is about a man, right? And the end of the chapter that Samir read out, the, if you pay attention to the very last uh, sentence, his back was turned uh, uh, to me, yet I reckon, did he live, on, live in one of these concrete shells like a hermit crab, right? So what ends up here is that the hermit crab ends up being an allergy for this man, right? And you have this story, an anecdote where this man is being attacked or being snarled at by a, a, a bunch of dogs. Uh, and, and, and there's this whole sort of, there's, there's a situation, there's a continuum of relationship that, that people are noticing there. Uh, and you realize that even though there is literal description of the scene in the beach, what the dogs do, how the dogs hunt crab, how this man is actually fishing out the crab, there is all of that. But then we realize, that the crab itself is about the man. It's not about the crabs at all. And it's definitely not about the hermit crab, which only, in fact, in, in that entire chapter, there is no discussion on hermit crabs and their behavior, except for this very big idea that we you know about the hermit crab's behavior is that it seeks out the shells of other creatures, has no home of its own. So even with this, is, it, is this man like a hermit crab would mean this man is homeless, that this man occupies spaces to live in that are not his own and possibly changes, changes and moves around and finds dwellings in different places as, as a homeless person, as, as homeless people often do, right? So if we think about it, uh, in a book that is, say, about nature and you're writing about nature, what does this tell us? This particular example tell us about description um, and about the relationship of humans who are writing the description or describing the relationship between humans and an object in nature. So what have we learned here? Any responses, any observations? Anything interesting you noticed about the description here? Any additions to what we learned with Dillard? Yes, Gia. Uh, yeah, so I think in this I noticed that previously we were talking about um, personifying nature and objects in nature, but, you, but here the entire opposite is happening where we are using nature to talk about a man. So that's what I noticed here. Yeah. Very good, good job. Nature, using nature to talk about people. So, you know, one of the questions that I think you are facing is, okay, what am I writing? I can describe. I can describe a butterfly or a flower or a dog or a human being in relation to a dog. But what am I writing about, right? So here is where you begin to notice that what you are writing about in these examples, and, and this is purely on the basis of the examples we are looking at, and that even when you are writing about nature, turns out you're really writing about human, human nature, human beings, right? So even though you are doing description and this kind of literary narrative will allow you to do that, other forms of environmental communication writing might not allow you that, but even there, 
why are people interested in writing about nature right even when you want to convey for example as bhattacharya's book does in large parts talks about what's happening in the sundarbans you know the erosion of uh, 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 land by sea um, you know settlements that have been the, the flooding in which actually most of sundarbans the islands the islands in the sundarbans are likely going to get drowned right and and the habitation we are interested in habitation we are interested in human lives and and which is the reason why we get interested in that so think about that so that was an excellent response here anybody else what do you notice here about descriptive writing and especially this question what are we writing about because that guides the narrative that tells us what we will even do with the description in this passage they he also describes the dog yes the description of the dog is also used to describe the crab Yes. Like so it's yes. Another animal to describe another animal to describe a human. Yes. Okay. So there are so there's the dog, there's the crab, there's the there's the person who's stealing food from the dog, which is the so there's a continuum. You're you're right to point out that there's a continuum of creatures, and of course there's the narrator, there's Bhattacharya who's looking all of this. and putting it down in a narrative for us to read it in a certain way you standing there might have read the whole scene differently right and notice how bhattacharya says you know in the beginning i thought that but then on closer inspection i changed my narrative and realized this is what's going on because i have spent a week on the beach and actually studied how the dogs hunt for crabs um uh, so you can notice you can see also that oh i thought it was this i was wrong but then it is this because i sta- sat and looked at it so there's a narrator there's a narrative there's a narrator changing the narrative about the scenery that is playing out uh there are there is the person that so there are people the crabs there's the dogs and there's a human being in a kind of a continuum there's a conflict over resources there's a conflict over why is why is a why is a man stealing food from dogs so think about that right so this is what is being put down this to answer the question what is it about uh, this gives you a bigger sense for why do people write about nature when they do and when they do what is it really about is it about human nature human habitat human interest or is it about the creatures that you are noticing right so that relationship that continuum is a very very interesting and important thing to note um uh, having done that if we move on uh what we notice is this right why are we writing what are we writing about and this is a quick excerpt from dillard i won't pause on this very long uh i'll just say that i uh some sentences i need you to notice here i would like to learn i would like to learn or remember how to live and the reason i put it separately is that they are not continuous quotations i would like to learn or remember how to live and then she says and i'll just read out that part i think it would be well and proper and obedient and pure to grasp your one necessity and not let it go to dangle from it limp wherever it takes you remember the naturalist sen right so what is she doing here what has she done with the weasel's behavior she was in it as some kind of template for how we should be as a template for how we should as an analogy for how we should live as a as an allegory for how so this is not just a momentary simile or a well formed metaphor but an allegory for life right so she really expands it and she says you know so she's uh, thinking about right why is she writing the piece because she would like to learn or remember how to live so she is at some point in her life where things are probably not making sense what happens to all of us and the covid years have not helped but things seem meaningless but things seem like why am i even doing what i'm doing can someone please remind me and there are no reminders no one is going to come and tell you you have to go find it and she figures it and she figures it from a weasel and what is that grasp your one necessity and not let it go 
uh, and to dangle from its limb wherever it takes you, even to death, even to the heights. Uh, and you know, there's another anecdote about an eagle. I hope we have time to get to it. But even if we don't, I think the point is made, right? So if we have to answer the question, what is this essay about? Uh, what would we say? Is it about weasels? Is the essay about weasels? Is that the point? Why is she writing about her encounter with a wild weasel? Who is this? So what is this description about and ultimately who is this description about? If we are looking to write descriptions, then these are some of the questions we need to ask ourselves as we are working with an object from nature, a photograph from nature, writing on, to describe it, you know, what is this about? Who is this about? So what about this one? So who is this dis description really about? If I were to ask that question, what would your answer be quickly? How to live your life. How to live? It's, it's about Dillard. It's about the author figuring out something, some insight that she desperately needs at that point to go on living, right? To grasp your one necessity, right? It would be okay to say that this is an okay. Remember the title is uh, uh, Living Like a Weasel or something like that, right? So the whole thing, the entire weasel description is an analogy for her, uh, it's, a, it's an allegory for her to, want, to tell herself how she wants to live her life, right? Okay, so you saw how that moved from Bhattacharya to Dillard to really then think about when we're doing descriptions, it's not just those literal details. Look at the kind of narrative layers that are coming in with the help of things like uh, 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 metaphor and simile and personification, what, what narrative framing and how those descriptive details are being made meaningful. I think that's the link to remember as we move from Bhattacharya to Dillard. So that brings me to you know, this, this fine and we'll go back and I want to dwell on this idea of imagery and metaphor because I think much of the skill of writing actually lies there. So here I have uh, one more text. It's a favorite, favorite text of mine. It's a haiku. It's a haiku by Basho. It's a classic. Most of you have possibly encountered it. If you haven't, I'm happy to introduce uh, this to you. But let's look at it. This is all it, that it is. And it's like one of possibly one of the most famous pieces of literature uh, that has traversed across the world. This is in Japanese, but you have here an English translation. An old pond, frog jumps in, sound of water. Sometimes the last sentence, sound of water, is just translated as splash, right? An old pond, frog jumps in, sound of water. I let you, I let that sink in for a moment. And as you pause on this, an old pond. Now remember how we define imagery, images? The something or that more than one of your senses captured and, and sort of understood and, 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 uh, is a, and you're able to note that down. So an old pond, the action of a frog jumping in and sound of water, right? Sound of water, splash. Again, we talked about it in a previous example. Obviously, I got it from here where it's both visual as well as the sound. An old pond, we don't know. It might be stinking. We don't know, right? Frog jumping in, action, movement, all of that has happened. But it's all that this haiku is, is just images. There is no narrative. It doesn't tell you how to understand it. And you may turn around and say, well, why is this one of the most popular pieces of literature that so many people around the world read and translate and treasure and love? Why do I, right? It's saying there's an old pond, there's a frog that jumps in and there's a sound of water. What's the big deal? That it's just three images connected, but three images, but then it, it doesn't tell you what sense to make of it. If we compare that to the sentences that I have to the right side that we've been looking at, these are not new pieces of text. Who knows what he, which is the reason, thinks. Notice how that's a very different kind of an engagement with the weasel than old pawn frog jumps in sound of water. Doesn't tell you what it means. Here also Dillard is saying, I don't know what it means, but saying that, you know, I'm trying to understand what it means. And by the end of it, she'll give us the meaning as we saw, right? Then something obedient to instinct, he bites his prey, 
blah, blah. Those literal things of description like the frog jumping in is there, but then there is obedient to instinct. So we may ask of the haiku, why is the frog jumping into the water, into the pond? Is it obedient to its instinct? Is that what frogs do? They jump into the water. So even though, so notice the difference between the haiku and the sentences where one attempts to explain the literal images and the haiku just doesn't, just gives you the images and lets you figure it out for yourselves as you might, right? At first, it seemed his shabby clothes had roused these dogs, but then it turned out to be different. So what the difference again is between this haiku and the kind of essays that you're reading, chapters that you're reading, and perhaps writing with the descriptive assignment that you have to do, what difference do you see between the haiku and what uh, the others are doing? And in order to, so clearly I've already given away part of the answer by saying, it's making it meaningful. It's not leaving it to the readers to figure out what the meaning is. Obedient to instinct. I don't know what the weasel thinks, but then the weasel will become an allergy. All of that is there. So if I were to ask you, what do we do to make imagery into metaphor? And metaphor is basically then helping us make a meaningful narrative. And the pieces that you are writing, I don't know the exact assignment. But I do know that it has to be a meaningful narrative. So if you have just a bunch of description prompted by a photograph, that won't happen, right? So you need to add something to it to make it a meaningful narrative. What do you add? What have Dillard and Bhattacharya added? That Basho hasn't. Ananya, could you repeat your question, please? So my question is, what have Dillard and Bhattacharya added to the kind of descriptive details they are working with to make it a meaningful narrative that is missing from Basho? Basho just gives you images, doesn't tell you what to make of it. Bhattacharya and Dillard tell you what to make of it, and we've looked at that example. So my question is, well, what have they added? How is it becoming a meaningful narrative? If we can figure that, then we know what to do with our descriptions as well. From what like I can tell initially, they have some kind of encounter, so they are a character of the narrative. Um, but in the haiku, the poet is not a character, it's, he's not featured at all, he's not thought of. But here it's their engagement, which is why so it's wonderful, it. lovely. So, one point right away you see is that in Dillard and Bhattacharya, there are characters, right? There are people, there's a population and, and the author might be a character or the author might be describing a character. It might be both. So there are characters in narrative. There are people in the narratives. Authors are character, but there are others as well. So, so that's there. That's there for sure. Excellent point. Anything else do you notice? What kind of question are they answering? So first one is a question. Who knows what a visa thinks? So that's a question. There are questions. Can you formulate other kinds of questions that the authors might be asking and answering uh, as they go along? And the question is not visible, but they're answering some question. Just like why they're behaving as they are. So why Very good. Excellent. Why are they behaving the way they are? And you may have an answer to it. You may not have an answer to it. You may present it as a question to which you have no answer. You may present it. I got it first. I, I had an answer. It was wrong. And now I'm giving you an answer that I think is correct. Right? But this question as to why are they behaving the way they are behaving? Excellent. Very, 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 very well. Good. Anything else? Okay, let's work with that. You can think about it uh, uh, later also. But these are two very, very good and important points, which then brings us back to our exercise. Right? So you've already written three sentences. We are going to write uh, a few more. So write a sentence. So again, start answering these as I, one sentence, don't think about it too much. Write a sentence where you imagine the person whose chappals these might be. 
And I said, imagine. <laughs> Don't go into what you know. <laughs> imagine. So that, is that a one word sort of thing? The person or some kind of? Imagine, write one sentence where you imagine the person who's chappas. So you said, no, the characters, somebody said that to make a meaningful narrative, you need a character. It could be the person who's describing it. That person could be the character, but it could also belong to someone else, like that man on the beach, right? So this is up to you now, one sentence and type it in the chat box, write it on your own. This is open to imagination. You don't have to, uh, you know, there's no wrong answer to this. But you need a character. And the next you can have a one word answer if you like. Where is this person? So there's a character. So if you have a character, the character has to be located somewhere as suggested by these images. Where is the location of this character? Where is this person? The owner of the chappal seems to be an orderly person as their chappals are not flung far together, but arranged neatly, lovely. So you're beginning to imagine a person who's orderly, neat. Um, okay, what are some of the other characteristics that go along with person and where is this person? So build on that, Divya, where is this person? This orderly, neat person is where? Listen, that's what I'm sort of struggling with because I don't. I think it would take a while for... Uh... The chapel. So I see a few starfish on his uh, slippers. Mm -hmm. I see. I, I'm not sure how where the slippers. You, where do you think uh, uh, starfish and shells and seaweed might be available? No, and, and obviously a beach. So then, abhi ke liye beach is good. You can also imagine other places. But you imagine that this is a scenery in a beach. A person has arranged these chapels like this and stuffed with them, uh, stuffed them with shells. All right, very good. How close is this person to the... So, so now there are two different questions. If you're working on the butterfly uh, image, the que this question is for you. Number three, how close is the person to the butterfly? What does this say about the butterfly? What does this say about the energy of the person? And if you're doing it on the other one, your question is, why do you think this person collected all the sea creatures on the chapel? What do you think this person did with them? What does this say about the sea creatures? What does this say about the person? Uh, Anani, there's a message in the chat uh, still referring to the sea creatures. Huh. Uh, this is Sarah writing, Ariel left behind her slippers, not needing them anymore when she went back to sea. Very good. This is a short story. Wonderful. This is like the beginning. This is If you start expanding on this, this is already a story. Right. What you have here is a narrative. Ariel left the chapels behind and the sea creatures gathered in it on their own because they know Ariel and they know Ariel's chapel. And then she didn't need it. Ariel went back to the sea. This could be expanded into an entire story with fun descriptions of all kind. Wonderful. Well done, Sarah. So character, the minute you bring in character, location, who is doing all of this, who's looking, who are involved you begin to see a narrative kind of forming, right? Then you connect them, you imagine encounters. Um, so if a person is sitting very near a butterfly, what can you say about the butterfly? What can you say about the person? I said that um, this person isn't afraid of the combination pink and neon green. The person is not afraid, but will a butterfly come sit near a person who's moving around a lot or is restless? Dia has something to say in the chat. Dia is saying that, okay, you know, a um, butterfly is brave or accustomed to. Excellent. So this tells you something about human butterfly habitat where the butterflies are not scared about, scared of humans anymore, right? So it could say something about the butterfly. Could it say something about the person, the same thing? Moving on, I think you get the point that say, say a person is sitting really quietly. Like if, if you move, I, I doubt a butterfly is going to sit around you. And, and if this is in the wild, like I'm not talking about butterfly parks where butterflies are again accustomed to humans, but it could be depending on what, you, what the location is. If you describe this person in a butterfly garden, 
then butterflies are used to human beings visiting and they'll sit on your shoulder and sit on your chappal no problem right but if it's not the case and a butterfly sits near you and sits near you long enough for you to photograph it then there must be the person must be sitting really still must be capable of sitting really still otherwise it wouldn't happen right okay so you get the point you get the point that the minute you add characters and that encounter uh, what how you frame the description sort of becomes a little evident so if you're struggling with that part here's something to try out and see if that's working and finally as i said i wanted to talk about the element of strangeness right um that's what the title was and i am looking at the time there are only 6 minutes so i'm going to uh, take you through this and then you can think about this on your own uh, so on the left you have the story of uh, another another anecdote that dillard gives you and the anecdote is about uh, this uh, ernest thompson seaton shot an eagle out of the sky and when the eagle is shot turns out that there's a skull of a weasel attached to its neck and so dillard imagines imagines well what happened did the eagle eat the rest of the weasel uh, so the eagle might have tried to attack or kill the uh, kill the weasel to eat it but the weasel instinct obedient to the instinct caught hold of its neck but clearly not the strangle hold that kills creatures but enough and it doesn't let go right so it's caught on to it and so did the eagle eat the rest of it what happened we don't know all we have is an eagle with a skull of a um uh, a weasel attached to its throat uh, um so that's the imagery and to me it's like such a weird strange thing right in fact a man stealing food from dogs on a beach that's a very weird strange out of place thing as well and that's the anecdote that we've already been looking at from the beginning of our tacharya's chapter so part of the description part of the work of description is not just to make images accessible in terms of what they mean but to make images accessible in terms of you know it's out of placeness right so one is you you know you wrap everything in a narrative and it makes sense the other is details that are just like what the hell like what is this right which is sometimes even difficult to then wrap into a narrative or you struggle with it how do you make sense of this right and uh, this is and and there are other examples in what you will read so dwelling on weirdness dwelling on out of placeness dwelling on the strangeness of familiar things and quickly i'll mention you know the friendship between wordsworth and coleridge for those of you who know these two romantic poets from england they started this one poetry project and they said okay wordsworth said all right i will write about ordinary things in nature so you all read daffodils for example no school kid in india gets away without having read daffodils uh, sometime in their lives so the idea being so wordsworth part of the deal was that i'll write about ordinary things in nature like daffodils and i'll show how they are actually extraordinary and coleridge's part of the deal was i will write about extraordinary things supernatural things and write as if it's entirely ordinary right so you get zanadu you get you know uh, uh, the 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 old mariner um, the ancient mariner you know uh, so you you get so they do a pact and they say it's possible to look at supernatural weird things and it's just so ordinary and it seems so normal and to look at something like a daffodil and it can seem really extraordinary and that always stayed with me because i realized that's it it's a way of read it's it's a way of looking it's a way of looking it's a way of meaning making and that's something we can think about as we are if you're describing something really ordinary you know what's extraordinary about it and dwelling on its weirdness on its strangeness helps you do that if you're looking at something extraordinary then finding the analogy the words that make them accessible and available and normal then gives us the words to write about it right so i wanted us to think about it a bit now we are not going to have time for this we have only 2 minutes but the last exercise and i'm sure uh, if you want to add this up uh, uh, what i would like you to do is and you know you can respond quickly uh, unmute and speak or speak up is there anything weird or strange about all of this you know these these two images that we've been looking at is there anything weird about it is there anything strange and out of place about it 
anybody wants to either the, yeah anybody wants to just quickly respond we have like a, another minute we can maybe take another five minutes but i don't want to keep you too long after this it could be about just the interaction between human and natural things yeah it could be and if you dwell on it long enough you're like why is a butterfly sitting on a plastic strap of a chappal butterflies should not be sitting on plastic straps of chappal someone said green stock like you didn't even imagine that that's what it was right so there's something really strange that a butterfly is sitting on a plastic chappal if you look at the other image you know all these sea creatures that have been you can you can say oh, it's a treasure trove this and that but the fact of the matter is it's all dead so what you have collected what you bought in that snapshot is basically a whole bunch of dead creatures right and we love to think of you know treasures or oh, this looks so beautiful and everything it's basically dead sea life that has been uh um, you know kept on uh you know again plastic and rubber chappal and what's the connection between you know sea life the, the the ecological impact of plastic and rubber and all of that and sea life if you begin to develop that analogy you don't land up in a cute kind of nice sweet fairy tale kind of thing like ariel leaving a chappal behind or or one of those narratives right so the minute you latch on to something strange about it it also gives you a narrative in into saying more about what you're describing and what you're saying about it so uh, and then i would basically ask you to line up all your sentences please do please do this on your own line up all your sentences and then this last observation what does it do does it make you rewrite all of that does it make you frame all those descriptions in a different way so that also is another way to say more about the descriptive prompt that you are using in a photograph or a drawing uh, as you do that so that's it i am at 1 uh, uh, minute past time but i think is it okay joya if we take another 5 6 minutes to see if anybody has any observations or questions i'll stop sharing my questions would be actually great because they are in the process of writing I'll be happy to take questions, and I am happy to stay a bit longer too. I just didn't know what everybody's uh, schedules are like. So, so happy to hear. Did you learn anything new about descriptions? That's the most important thing. Did you learn any new strategy, any new way of thinking about the work of descriptions that you may then utilize in your writing? And here I am looking for compliments. Yes, please start. <laughs> I think it was. very structured i don't think i would have thought of it this way normally i would just write whatever comes to mind but what i found particularly interesting was creating a narrative out of certain imagery so not providing random imagery of what you see but trying to have a consistent theme and i think we saw that in the middle piece a lot where it's one theme and you're using imagery related to that theme and coming back to it at the end so how it all just ties into one piece together it's not random bits of information and then suddenly ending where you have no idea at all yeah and also that it's coming from it it's not coming from outside so the you know dilett find you know, that the dilett says that i want to live grasp on to your one necessity and dangle if it even if it's to the point of death comes from the weasel's behavior it doesn't come from outside and i think that's the important thing to notice and that's where i think uh uh, uh basho's uh, haiku becomes important also that it's only three images but it's about that moment and what comes from it not from outside right so yeah. that's i think an important thing to remember joya yes this is this is useful because you know they did a first draft workshop mm -hmm. in peer review mm -hmm. and they noticed when they read other people's you know their own colleagues pieces that sometimes the getting a meaning out is coming somewhat artificially at the end you have to prefigure it yeah from the beginning i think some people yeah. have that issue yeah yeah now they can go back and when they read they, you know they're thinking about it it doesn't have to be mentioned that this is going to be about this it can be yes. prefigured in the end. in fact i would recommend the following again coming from the practice of haiku and basho is that don't decide what the meaning will be from before delve into the description in as much detail the do that first step of images 
So you took a photograph or you drew something from something that you looked at. Go back to that moment, not just visually what it looked, what did it sound like? What was I doing that day before and after, right? I took the photograph. Get into all kinds of details, describe it and let what it has to be about emerge from it. And then it will be a real piece of writing and work and not a homework. And you want this to be a real piece of writing and work. Um, not something that checks the boxes of, oh, I did my assignment. And it will be so much fun and you'll be so satisfied. You'll never want to stop writing like this. And that's when you know that it's worked. I also like the idea of the strangeness and weirdness. Yes. I don't think we had actually thought about that. Mm -hmm. It was coming through, peeping through a bit and not the way people were thinking about the objects, but we hadn't given it that much. Yeah. So thought that there has to be that moment of making strange because that's when you pay attention. Yeah. Not yeah. You know, pay attention to what that means. So that would that that will see how that works out. Um, yeah. And and in my experience, that's again a very very useful practice to not just because you know we look at things and read things to explain it away meaningfully and it's all very meaningful. But what about the things that stick out and don't? immediately makes sense you know in life and in literature and in art we sometimes tend to skip that but paying attention to that again takes you away from saying something very cliched like a butterfly on a flower can have the most cliched uh, uh, set of uh, associations with it but if you can shift it by noticing something about it if it's shifted then that's when you have something new to say something um, new and transformative to see and say. And I think it's possible. I think it's possible in all the images that you all are working with that I saw. Uh, in the chat, Gia had written, I found the workshop very interesting, learned a lot about how to create, how to create narrative in description and how to use objects in nature to describe human nature and characteristics. Thank you so much. So that's it. That's the other point, right? write yourself into your description or put characters in if it's fictional or whatever if you want that expanded narrative then then and you know again don't do it artificially in the sense that i mean you can if you're really good you, you can imagine it or whatever but if you're starting out and struggling i think it's easier to write with what we know so you know work on, think remember well where were you when you took that photograph what were you doing before, after, who was with you? Were you alone? Is it somebody else's photograph that you didn't take at all? Uh, you know, so work in a character and it doesn't have, if it's not a piece of fiction, it doesn't have to be an imagined character in that way. But even your own person, even that, that meaning making can't happen without people to whom it is meaningful. Right? So see how that works out. That should be a fun thing as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. Keep it posted on how the assignment goes. Thank you so much, Samir. Thank you, Samir. See you guys. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.